fantasy short stories. Of Portals and Portents by Leslie Heron Chapter 3 Celestine With muffled footsteps, Vel found himself trudging along the dusty hallway of the High Inquisitor's grand estate. He couldn't remember why he had come. Atticus and Piper were away on their trip. He stopped before a large oak door, still lost in thought, when it creaked open just enough for a shaft of light to cut into the gloomy hall. Curiosity peaked, he placed a hand on the door and pushed. Stepping into the large office, his eyes scanned over the ornate wood panel walls, bookshelves, and work desk. He remembered this room from the last time he and Piper spent an evening snooping for anything interesting. But that hadn't been since... since... Elias? His bangs with the shock of white hung low over his glasses, obscuring his face as he scribbled furiously into a notebook. Elias paused his writing and looked up. Ah, thank you for joining me. Please, come in. Vel attempted to move, but his feet felt glued to the floor. All he could manage was a shuddering breath. A loud click told him the door had shut behind him, and he looked over his shoulder to see a familiar figure. Tragedy in his porcelain mask released the knob and moved into the room, taking a seat in the only chair across from Elias. I was surprised to get your summons. Does that mean you have reconsidered my plan? In the manner of speaking, yes. Elias leaned back in his chair, tapping his fingers anxiously on the armrest. But I wish to avoid any unwarranted violence. These are, after all, my people. Vel frowned. Both of them had taken no notice of his presence, even though he was standing there plain as day. He looked around, noting the lack of color in the tapestries and the embroidered runner. Everything had a blurred outline, like static. He was dreaming. He allowed himself to relax, calming the panic inside him as Vel dragged a hand across his mouth. There was no imminent danger. Elias was not back. But how was he dreaming? His AI was supposed to be suppressing his ability to do so. The two men's voices became a mumble to Vel as he struggled to wake himself up. <sighs> no luck. How are you supposed to stop dreaming when a computer controls your unconscious state? Amy, what's going on? Silence. He was ready to call out her name again when Elias slammed his hand onto the wooden desk, pulling his attention back to the scene playing out before him. For the last time, tragedy, I understand the laws, having written most of them myself. I need this diversion to keep that cyborg at bay. Elias stood, snatching his notebook off the desk. Wouldn't it be easier to simply dispose of him then? Hanging his head, Elias placed his hands flat on the desk. Believe me, if it were that easy... I would have asked you to do so by now. His meddling has become tiresome. But I have a feeling we might need him. If not to open the portal, then perhaps as leverage in case we run into his brother along the way. Sir? Elias straightened up. Tragedy, why do you follow me? The man paused, thinking. You have vision and the tenacity to achieve anything you put your mind to. And if I set my mind to, say, exacting revenge on someone? Tragedy shifted uncomfortably in his chair. Then the devil himself could take notes. Exactly. Vel's sibling sounds very similar to myself. Elias moved across the room to stand before the portrait of a corpulent old man a High Inquisitor of the past. I don't need to imagine the wrath that would fill me if someone killed my brother. Dreams weren't supposed to work like this. 
Fell felt uneasy as he realized he was an intruder in someone else's memory, especially having to listen to them casually debate the pros and cons of his murder. Elias raked his eyes across the oil painting, admiring its rough surface. Give me some time. His fingers traced along the ornately carved frame until he pushed in on the center knot of a swirl pattern. I will see if I can't convince that metal man to join us in our endeavor. There was a loud click, and a latch released somewhere behind the portrait. If he doesn't come around, then you can kill him. His curiosity peaked once more. Vel took several steps towards Elias as he swung the painting back to place his notebook in the hidden cubby behind it. The cyborg stood on the balls of his feet, craning to look over the Inquisitor's shoulder to see what else was inside. A ripple of dread tore up Elias's spine, and he slammed the painting back into place, spinning on the spot. Clearly startled, his eyes scanned the room until they locked onto what he had sensed but not seen. You. With a jolt, Vel took a step back. Elias was staring directly at him. Not through him, but at him. As the Inquisitor reached a hand in his direction, he recoiled hard enough that he felt the floor lurch and his dream dissolved into wisps of swirling colors. Everything faded to black as he began to fall, down and down an endless pit. Instead of waking, however, he felt his back connect with something solid, knocking the air from his lungs. Without even opening his eyes, Vel knew this dream was different. He could feel the grit of the sand between his fingers and smell the decaying scent of a long, dead world. This place... This scenario, he was familiar with it. It was the reason he had hacked his brain to prevent dreaming at all. Not this dream again. He opened his eyes to white sand that stretched on into the endless night, glittering silently beneath a starless sky. He couldn't summon the courage to face this nightmare. Amy... The single word came out with a shaky breath. No response. There was no ripcord to pull him out. Vel stood slowly, rooted to the spot, refusing to look around. One of the worst days of his life put on repeat in his sleeping mind. How many times must he be forced to relive this moment? He balled his hands into fists and clenched his eyes shut, willing himself to wake up. Amy! Hot tears leaked from his eyes when he heard the rush of footsteps approach him. Not again. Vel looked up to see his brother, Attila, Brig, and Evan rushing past him to where he knew a swirling purple gate hung, wreathed in thorny vines. Stop! Please! His voice was tiny as he begged himself to wake up. Vel turned to see Eric silently screaming at him, and, unable to control himself, he reached out and wrapped his arms around his brother in a tight hug. Then with a shove, he forced his sibling into the waiting arms of Brig, who hauled the wide-eyed man through the swirling vortex. Tears streamed down Vel's face as he sobbed, unable to do anything but watch. Nothing he tried ever changed this dream. There was an explosion of light, a deafening boom, and then silence. A horribly painful reminder that he was alone. Why couldn't he wake up? Something slammed into him, and he felt his back buckle against the impact. Vel made to cry out, but his voice was ripped from his body as he looked down to see a massive stone fist wrapped around his torso, black goo leaking from the seams in the masonry. It cinched tight around him like a vice as he was lifted from the ground and spun to face its owner. A towering, bird-faced monolith stared back at him. Alpha used the ancient structure to crush his body. Vel felt the visceral tear 
as his bones shattered and something punctured his lung. I will find a way through, and I will make your brother watch as I destroy world after world. Through the blinding pain, Vel tried to call out to Amy once more to save himself from the worst that was still to come. Over and over he screamed to his AI in an attempt to avoid the part that he had never told anyone about. But he had no air left in his lungs. Black slime began to leak out of the cracks of Alpha's fist, pooling up around Vel's neck. He locked his lips closed and clenched his eyes shut, struggling to keep his head above the surface. But the black tar engulfed him. He could feel it pouring into his ears, up through his nose, and forcing his mouth open, streaming down his throat. He hacked and coughed, but despite it all, he could feel it working its way through him, infecting not only his body, but his cybernetics as well. Alpha was going to kill him, again, just as he had done before, suffocating him with inky goo. Suddenly, the grip fell away, and he burst up through an ocean of black, gasping for breath. Vel hit the sandy ground, and the pain faded from his body, but there was a ringing rush of sound in his ears. This was... different. Odd. I thought I killed you. Vel felt a cold chill run through him at the sound of Alpha's voice. He had never heard those words before. He spun to see, instead of the rocky monolith, the beast had become a large, antlered servitor, black as night with a macabre human skull jutting from its chest. He opened his mouth to scream as the creature stepped towards him. Maintenance complete. Resuming normal functions. Vel shot awake, launching himself upright in his bed. The rush of noise in his ears was deafening, and his throat felt raw. He wheezed and coughed until the panic subsided and his room came into focus. His cat, Chum, jumped on the bed to investigate, offering him several chirps and an invitation for pets. There was an uncomfortable tingle in his fingers as he reached over to stroke the cat on its back and his breathing returned to normal. Damn it, Amy. I thought I asked you to monitor my dreams and keep me from having those nightmares. My apologies, but I had already suspended my maintenance routines twice already. I could not postpone the updates any longer. Pushing his forehead into his hands, Vel let out a lengthy sigh. You couldn't warn me beforehand? He paused when there was a tickling sensation along the left side of his nose. He pushed a finger into the corner of his eye, dabbing away liquid. Tears? From his synthetic eye? He pulled his hand back to see a drop of what looked like oil, except it was thick and black. His breath caught in his throat. I am happy to return you to sleep and monitor your unconscious state once more. Just forget it. I'm awake now. He used the sheets to wipe away the inky tear from his fingers and shifted in the bed. Vel looked up at the wall covered in tally marks and, out of habit, reached over to add another scratched line. But hesitation stayed his hand, his fingers hovering over the surface. Of course his dreams would be of Eric and Elias. There was still a decision he had to make. And so he says to the other bloke, Why not? I'm a fun guy. Vel let out a soft growl of disapproval as the man in the next barstool draped himself uncomfortably close to him, laughing hysterically at his own joke. There was no way around it. He was cranky. And the single shot of whiskey he had been staring at was failing to help his mood any. Get it? Get it? Fun guy? The drunk patron belted out another round of raucous laughter before he managed 
<laughs> because, because he was a mushroom. Between wheezing breaths. Very funny, Martin. Now go home. You're drunk. There was no hint of laughter in Val's words. Though he did smirk a little as the man attempted to argue that he was in fact not drunk, but instead slipped off the stool and collapsed into a heap on the cobblestones, letting out a loud snore to signal he had passed out. Picking up his shot glass, Vel stared at the amber liquid swirling within. Thinking of actually drinking this one, something must really be wrong. He looked up at the brilliant feathered visage of the bird-faced bartender and sighed with a shake of his head. No, maybe I'm fine. Everything was not fine. He couldn't believe he was out this late, pushing past midnight, surrounded by workers and locals as they drowned their sorrows. He looked down at the brown liquid in his glass. He had made a promise to Piper that he would stay away from libations, but whenever Vel had a tough choice to make, he found himself here, staring at a glass of pure temptation. In the past, the pressure had always forced him to come to a decision before his willpower failed, and he could walk away another day sober. But tonight was about to get the better of him. A middle-aged man, dressed in robes of pure white, slid into the now-vacant seat and waved down the bartender. Something cheap but strong, please. The orange glow of the lantern shone brightly off the large golden emblem draped across the front of the man's vestments. Vel raised a brow, setting the cup back down. I didn't know priests could drink. With a wry look... The man turned in his seat. If the scholar didn't want me to drink, he wouldn't have made so many idiots for me to deal with. The priest extended a hand. Father Aiden. Vel glanced down at the gesture before returning his attention back to his glass with a shrug. Not to be rude, Padre, but I'm what you call a heathen. I doubt you'd want to sully yourself with a handshake. His face fell for a moment before Aiden dropped his hand and used his other to accept the dark bottle from the bartender. Not a believer, then. He took a long sip of his drink and shivered at the caustic burn. In a magical being in the sky that determines your fate in the afterlife? Vel shook his head. I'm afraid that ship sailed the first time I died and woke up a glorified toaster. Frowning, Aiden studied the man, noting the metal plates that lined his face and neck. I see. I can't blame you. I would be on the fence about that myself. I thought you were a priest. Vel looked over at the man, raising a brow. Yeah, but not a religious one. Aiden idly spun the bottle between his hands. Our god is just a man. Taking a closer look... Vel noted his white cassock bore the symbol of a golden book with a feather quill laid across it. He let out an exhale as he rolled his eyes. Ah, the Church of the Illuminated Path. Just another in the laundry list of Chester's pet projects. This one was part of his Give Back Better initiative. To be honest, Vel couldn't remember much of the Prime Minister's story at the time. He had other things on his mind. But, according to Chester, way back when Elias had garnered power, one of his first acts as High Inquisitor was to shut down all the libraries and churches, most of which, at the time, had been one and the same. In Chester's youth, the priests would feed the orphans and street urchins, as long as they would listen to the day's sermon and take a book from their libraries to empower themselves with knowledge. The man had taken the lesson to heart, spending most of his own life sheltering the abandoned children of Avis, empowering them with skills and knowledge. Dozens of craftsmen owed their expertise to his rebellious enterprise. Now, as Prime Minister, he had reignited the movement, 
minus the heavy-handed religion. Humanitarians spread all over the city, helping the needy, educating the masses, and, on occasion, offering insight to those who needed it. The robes and titles for many were simply a nod to those who came before. But a fair few still followed the teachings of the scholar. Aiden took a long pull from his drink, his face puckering in disgust. Blech. Guilty as charged. What can I do for you, my son? Lifting his glass off the table once more, Vel swirled the contents around, watching the lantern light dance across its amber surface. Uh, unless you can make a life-altering decision for me, I think I'm beyond your help. With a smile, Aiden set down his bottle and swiveled in his chair once more. Troy me! Chuckling at the absurdity, Vel paused. Why not get an outside perspective? Well, I have a chance to get something I desperately want, but it's equally likely to unleash something horrible. Ah, oh, a dilemma as old as time. I'm sure to have some insight, but, uh... Aiden made a grand gesture of overturning his empty bottle with a drastic sigh. I'm a bit forgetful at the moment. Vel slid a few coins onto the bar, and, in short order, a fresh one arrived. A grin returned to Aiden's face. The problem, my son, is that you're looking at this as though it were binary. Two options. Deny yourself the chance, or risk everything. When in reality... He paused, reaching over to swap his bottle of rot gut for the glass of whiskey in the other man's hands. There is always an additional choice that you simply haven't considered. He tossed back the liquid gold with a satisfied sigh and stood turning to leave. Think outside the box, my friend. There you will find your answer. His mouth hanging ajar... Vel watched as the priest stumbled in what he assumed was the direction of his parish, swaying slightly and humming a sailor's tune. A third option? What the hell kind of advice was that? Did he help? Vel jumped in his chair and turned to see Danny sitting on his other side, nursing her own glass. He narrowed his eyes. How long have you been here? She shrugged. Long enough to know you needed help. Did... did you just trick me into confessing to a priest? Danny pushed the glass to her lips, but there was a smile hidden on her face as she feigned innocence. Picking up the bottle of rotgut, Vel considered the priest's words. They mulled around in his mind, gaining speed, when he frowned, returning his attention to the pale-skinned woman next to him. How did you even know I was awake? Or here? With a warm smile, Danny offered him a casual shrug. I have my ways. She reached over, prying the bottle from the cyborg's hand and tossed back its contents, shuddering as the bitter alcohol warmed her throat. She let out a small cough and a shake of her head. Wow, Father Aiden really needs to get better taste in alcohol. No matter where he was in this massive city, she could always find him. It unnerved Vel to his core, and he was determined to get to the bottom of it. But for now, he settled on a sigh. I take it Chester wants his answer then? Yes, but he can wait a bit longer. I don't think he fully realizes what he is asking. She leaned back. I'm not going to rush you if you're not ready. Actually, I think the priest had a point. I've got an idea. A sick feeling that had nothing to do with his decision washed over Vel as he found himself retracing his steps on a familiar embroidered runner. Danny was speaking to him at length, but he heard none of it. He still had a sense of dread, but also hope. 
It wasn't until she had led him into the largest office room of the High Inquisitor's estate that reality seemed to catch up to him. Ah, Danny! Burning the midnight oil, are we? The girl bowed out of the way, making room for the cyborg. Father, I have some papers to deliver to the head of the congregation, and then I shall return here to help with anything pressing before turning in. That sounds good, my dear. Thank you. Chester nodded as she left the room and returned to the stack of tedious reports he had been pretending to read. Vel dragged his mechanical hand down across his face as their eyes met. The Prime Minister was all cozied up in a large, padded leather armchair, flipping aimlessly through a stack of papers. What are you doing up here? I thought your office was still in the university. Giving them up like a bad habit, Chester set down his work, looking up at the cyborg with a lazy smile. Until you've reached a decision about the rift, I figured I would remain up here in case there were any... developments. He folded his hands into his lap. Also, without Atticus here, it's marginally safer. A pang of irritation struck Vel as he was reminded of the current situation with the kids. He was still angry he had not been allowed to accompany them, but he understood. About that, I have an idea. In regards to the rift, Chester raised a brow. With a nod, Vel began to pace on the rug before the Prime Minister's desk. You said your people have the ability to close a portal should it open, right? It's all theoretical, but yes, they should. Chester drew his fingers down along his chin. What are you suggesting? My brother once used a portal, the space between worlds, as a cage. He sealed both gates closed, locking us inside with a monster. That's actually how I ended up here. Long story, but... Vel traced the outline of the rug with his pacing, moving from one end of the room to the other. Wait. Chester frowned, holding up a hand as he repeated, What are you suggesting? Vel pulled to a stop. Let it open. Then we can determine who is in transit. If it's my brother, then we're good. But if it's Elias, we can seal the portal with him in it, locking him away forever. Assuming we could do so in time. The absurdity of the plan was enough to pull Chester to his own feet. How would we determine? Stick our heads in and take a peek? Meanwhile, we simply let a madman casually stroll towards us with God knows what in tow? His voice squeaked in an effort to contain his emotions. Vel let out a growl as he began pacing once more. You have a team of scientists. I if they can't come up with another way, then yes. Let's stick our heads in and take a peek. I... He froze coming face to face with an oil painting of a corpulent old man. Placing his hands flat on the desk, Chester waited for the rest of an argument that never came. You what? You think this plan is as asinine as I do? Vel couldn't hear the Prime Minister's words as a pit dropped in his stomach. The room was exactly as it had been in his dream— down to the wooden paneled walls and faded tapestries. He reached out, running his mechanical hand along the ornately carved frame around the painting, stopping at a knot in a swirling design. It was just a dream, right? He pushed his finger against it, and the portrait gently detached from the wall, swinging outward. That pit grew heavier, as he reached in and took hold of a leather notebook. Curiously, Chester walked up behind the cyborg. What have you got there? Pulling on the snap, Vel cracked open the journal. His eyes widened as he thumbed through the pages. Just like his brother, Elias had scribbled on page after page with detailed drawings and information. But these... Each one was the same. 
He felt bile rise in his throat as he snapped shut the notebook. Close it. The painting? Vel spun on the spot, his voice shaking. The portal. We have to close it. Not that I'm arguing, but what of your brother? This could be your only chance to reunite with him. Chester knew the odds were stacked against them, but he wouldn't forgive himself if he didn't give the cyborg a chance. Averting his gaze, Vel clenched the book in his hands. I've already lost him, and everything I care about. My humanity, my family, the love of my life. He looked up. I can't lose the kids, too. We have to shut the portal down. Now. He didn't have time to explain the events that led up to this moment, not with everyone's life in danger. He reached for the door, flinging it open. Where are you going? Chester followed the man, giving chase into the hall. Slow down. The team isn't even up here at this hour. How are we going to close the rift? Vel's hand hovered over the ornate knob of the front door. I don't know, but we... There was a violent rumble that shook the walls, rattling the porcelain vases off their ledges and sending them crashing into the ground. He steadied himself as another rumble shook the estate, and he dropped the notebook. It landed on its spine, breaking open to reveal the pages within, each one covered in drawings of a black servitor with antlers and a human skull in the center of its chest. We thank you for joining us for this chapter of the novel Of Portals and Portents, book four by Leslie Heron in this ongoing series available here on Tall Tale TV. You can find links in the description to where you can listen to all her books and novellas, with new chapters appearing as they are being written and recorded. To which <laughs> the carrot says, don't invite that guy. <laughs> <laughs> so he says, and this is a good part, he says to the other bloke, Why not? I'm a fun guy. <laughs> Get it? Because he was a mushroom. Right? A mushroom? Martin, my son, I think you're missing the point of the story. The war? See, the carrot didn't want to invite the fun guy to the party because he thought he would take up to mushroom. Eh? Oh, yeah, no, I still don't get it. Scorner, give me strength or at least better booze. <laughs>